Welcome to an edited version of the live questions and answers podcast that was recorded in July of 2021. Now, I do want to mention that if you'd prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the Jongets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you can find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of those come with perks, like watching some videos early and advertisement-free, as well as voting on which of those videos are made. All right, let's jump into the questions. Uh, let's now go ahead and start this thing off. Uh, the first question coming in is from Anibal Rivera, and they said, are you excited for any new games at Essen? Um, wow, it is crazy to think that Essen is kind of coming. <laughs> it's halfway through July. Uh, Essen feels like it should be so far away, but I guess it's in October, and October is just a few months away. Um, I'm not coming up with anything. Actually, no, I take it back. The one thing that pops into my mind is the next game coming out from Delicious Games. It's called Messina... 13 something. <laughs> uh, if you search for delicious games in Messina, that should do it for you. Um, it's the next game that was designed by Vladimir Suhi, and I really like his designs, and I also really like the productions that come out from delicious games. Um, from a theming perspective, apparently this one is about the Black Death. It's like a Euro game about the Black Death, where you're in Messina, which is one of the first European port cities to get the Black Death, as it comes in from the east, and you're trying to, you know, survive it as best you can while dealing with all those things that are happening. I don't know much else b beyond uh, the images I've seen on Twitter, which show a bunch of hexagonal tiles that are kind of nestled against each other, and a bunch of icons, and, you know, a designer and art that I like. So uh, that I guess that's the one game that I, I can think of off the top of my head that I'm excited for. Actually, no, I take it back. There's another one. <laughs> it's starting to snap into my brain. Uh, there's actually a press release out for it this morning. It's called Imperial Steam, and it's coming out from Capstone Games. Um, they actually uh, put a press release out for this to like the press about a week ago, and the official one went out today. Um, this is a new game designed by the same person who designed uh, Lignum. Yeah, that one. And uh, Imperial Steam is supposedly a heavy uh, logistics-type train game with production and a big map with point-to-point -point stuff all over it. it. It looks really cool, and uh, it looks like the kind of thing that uh, I would like to play. So um, that is another one that I'm super interested in, and, and I have a good relationship with Capstone Games, so I I'm hoping to have an opportunity to try that one um, sooner rather than later, but who knows? I can be patient if I need to, but that one looks really cool. Um, I will say that I'm not planning on going to Essen this year. Um, I have a hotel room. I need to cancel that. <laughs> uh, it just seems like it may Maybe is one year too early to, to actually do that with COVID and all that kind of stuff and international travel. I live in California and uh, Essen, Germany is a long way away and a rather expensive trip. So I'm probably going to be postponing that until 2022, which is a bummer. Uh, I was planning on going last year in 2020. I didn't go in 2019 or 2018. So it's been a little while, I think. Anyway, <laughs> uh, there's still a lot of games that are coming out that I, I'm going to be really excited about. I can just think of two of them off the top of my head. Uh, next up, we have Shrey, and he says, uh, they say, uh, do you try to read rules when identifying these games that you might pick up? Uh, yes-ish. Well, let's think about this. Um, in the past, when I've gone, specifically when I've, like, gone to Essen and picked up the games, um, it's a long flight from California, um, like 13 hours or so, uh, with at least one stop. Um, so in the past, I've loaded up my iPad with a bunch of rule books, and I'll just read them on the plane while watching movies and that kind of thing. I can't read rules for, for 14 hours straight. Um, but it is something I try to do. Um, it, generally, it's like a high-level skim. Uh, and in particular, when I actually went to Essen and came back with like 30 games, it was an interesting Tetris game of fitting it into all of my luggage. So I really wanted to make sure I was only bringing home games that I would like. So yeah, I do try to read the rules uh, if possible. Um, and, you know, if there are videos, then I try to watch those videos. And uh, a lot of companies try to have videos come out before um, Essen actually starts or, you know, Gen Con or whatever uh, convention it is that things are coming out. And um, I definitely prefer to watch a video than read the whole rulebook if I'm just trying to get a taste for the game and to see if it's something that I want to pick up. Uh, Metal Brain says, what is your heaviest Euro that you love to play? The heaviest Euro that you are able to get to the table if it's different. Uh, so potentially two different games. Um, the heaviest Euro that I love to play is probably A Feast for Odin with the Norwegian's expansion. I'd say that one is pretty darn heavy. Um, I used to say through the ages, but I think I like A Feast for Odin more. Um, and as far as like a heavy game that I can actually get to the table, um, 
it kind of depends on what your definition of heavy is. Uh, my first thought there is probably terraforming Mars. A lot of people probably wouldn't call that heavy, but you know, it does have a, a longer playtime and longer playtime does not necessarily mean heavy. Um, so I don't know. I probably just say a feast for Odin for both of those. Uh, not that I get to play it that often, but I have played it a few times and it's one that many of the people I play games with have played with before. So it isn't the hardest thing in the world to actually get that one out onto the table and play. And it's just a game that I absolutely adore. It's such an amazing experience, but there's a lot going on. I definitely think the amount of things that you're juggling in your head makes that one a heavy one. Uh, Andy says, hi, John, did you ever play Foothills, the two player only version of Snowdonia? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I vaguely remember hearing about it. Um, I mean, as far as Snowdonia is concerned, I haven't actually played that either. I've played, um, what was it? The, uh, the tea based one. Oh my gosh. I can't remember the, uh, Alubari. Yeah. Alubari. I played that one a couple of times at BGGCon. Unfortunately, both times I played it, I played it incorrectly, um, which is really frustrating. And if I played the rules correctly, specifically with the fog and the action spaces, I think I would have enjoyed it more because I really liked the base idea for the system. And because of that, I, I certainly wouldn't mind trying uh, Snowdonia or Foothills. I just haven't had an opportunity to play either of those. Uh, Truck Driving Gamer says, I've been enjoying Oath by Cole Worley on Tabletop Simulator. Have you played it? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I would love to play that one. Uh, we have not played it yet. Uh, in our board gaming group, there has been some talk of, of trying to get a tabletop simulator version of that game played, because I don't think I know anybody who owns it. Um, it doesn't look like a game that would necessarily be my favorite, but it also looks intriguing, and there's so much hype for it that I, I'm quite curious. I feel like the more videos I watch about Oath, and the more podcasts I listen to, the less I understand what's actually going on with this game. Uh, so I kind of want somebody else to teach me the game, but I also feel like the more I learn from other people, the less I understand, so maybe it's something that I just need to read the rulebook for, but um, at this point, it hasn't made sense to actually dig into it. Like, I I've never done any uh, sponsored content for Letter Games at this point. Um, I did do a video for Vast many years ago, long before I did any sponsored content, um, and that game was certainly fascinating, although not designed by Cole Worley. Um, I did play Pax Pamir 2nd Edition, which was designed by Cole Worley a couple of times. So yeah, I'm curious to play Oath, but unfortunately, my only impression of it so far is I'm pretty confused as to what is actually going on from the media on it that I've uh, ingested already. Uh, let's see here. Jesse says, what game have you had to prepare for the longest before you were confident to do a tutorial? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I've made so many tutorials that it's going to be tough for me to think of more than a couple of examples. I mean, one thing that pops out, this wasn't the longest preparation, but um, one game is Trismegistus. Um, usually, when I do these tutorials, I have not actually played it before. I read the rules, and then I maybe ask the publisher some questions, and then I film the tutorial. Uh, but for that one, I read the rules, maybe asked a couple questions, and then remembered thinking, I need to play this with somebody else before I actually record the tutorial because I thought I understood how it all worked, but not really how it actually worked together because there's so many interesting systems in that game and I didn't want to show it poorly. Um, so yeah, I, I made sure to play a three player game of Trespa Guestus before I filmed the tutorial for it. Um, as far as the overall length of time before, it was maybe, I want to say Frosthaven, but I don't know. There's a lot of overlap with Frosthaven to Gloomhaven, and I felt like, you know, I'd already played Gloomhaven like 30 times when I made the Frosthaven tutorial. Uh, let's see, of other ones. Uh, I mean, Feudum, that one, <laughs> that one took quite a while for me to really understand it. In fact, Feudum was the very first video that I ever made where I put the text on screen that would say, like, skip to this next thing. Um, you know, I normally have the text in the top corner uh, that says, you know, skips to the next main thing. But it, Feudum was the first game where I say things like, you know, and then this happens and, um, and I'll talk about it later. And then the text on screen has a timestamp because there's just so many crazy things happening in that video that it didn't make sense say everything at once. Like there was, there was kind of a cyclical nature to that teach. And then from that point on, I've just continued to do that. Uh, so I'm kind of happy I, I figured that out from there. So I think I'll go with Feudum as my actual answer. Uh, there might be a better one out there, but that's the one that pops into my head. Uh, Shiva says, um, weird question. What table do you use to shoot and play your videos? Um, that's not a weird question. Um, actually, I love this table. <laughs> uh, this table right here, um, it's underneath the... Uh, uh, underneath this tablecloth, you can see it's kind of a, a plasticky uh, vinyl top to this table. And I've owned this table since 2006. I picked this up for $60 at a used furniture 
uh, store, and it is a tank. I, I literally, I don't call it a table, I call it the tank, because it has these fused legs on all sides, so it, like, doesn't really move, like, you have to really bonk into it to make it move, and, um, this was a kitchen table for myself for years. Uh, then I moved and a friend of mine used it for his kitchen table for a couple of years. Then we moved in uh, together and then this was uh, actually our tool bench in the garage for a couple of years. And then we, I moved again and then it was a kitchen table. And then we finally decided uh, at that point I was married or, you know, living with Jessica anyway. We wanted to get a fancy kitchen table. So that was the moment that this moved into the studio, but I've actually filmed on this table for, I think, every single video that I've filmed. Um, just back then, when this was our kitchen table, I just pulled all of this filming rig into the kitchen every time I wanted to make a video, recorded it there, and then broke it all down so that we could, you know, make dinner and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, I love this table. I feel like I have so many memories with this table. Uh, it's an extending one, so it's, it's particularly long, and I will honestly be emotional the day I don't have this table anymore. <laughs> I know that kind of sounds really silly. Uh, you were not expecting this uh, answer, I'm sure, and it's probably a really boring answer, but uh, yes, um, me and this table have a ton of memories, and and I still just come back to being amazed. I got this thing for 60 bucks. It was it was crazy. I remember seeing it and being like, is that tag correct? And it was, and it's like, I'm buying it. <laughs> I don't even think we were looking to buy a table that time. It was just a used um, stuff store, like uh, kind of like a Goodwill, but not. And uh, the, the table that all the stuff was on had a $60 mark. And I was like, can I buy the table underneath it? Anyway, very long answer to your question. Tabe Storm says, what do you do if you want to play buy, uh, play or buy a particular board game and there's nobody in your friends group who wants to play it? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I've definitely had this kind of creep into my gaming tastes because I've been so interested in train games and cube rails games for a while. And a lot of my friends are less interested in those things. Um, <laughs> one thing I've done is watch a whole bunch of playthrough videos of other people playing those games. Uh, <laughs> you know, I make playthroughs because I like to consume playthroughs. So I get, you know, I kind of live vicariously through other people playing the games that I really want to play, uh, which I imagine is something a lot of people do with my channel, which is why the channel has been doing good. Um, but also I, I try to think about which specific friends might be more open to it than others and maybe try to set up a situation in that way. Like for Cube Rails, for example, uh, now that I'm starting to play games in person again, I want to set up a day where I, I invite specific people who I think will like them and just say, hey, let's come together and for like four hours play like three different Cube Rails games and just see if they like it and hope that they like it. Um, you know, I'm trying not to put too much pressure on that situation, but I certainly do hope that they would. Um, so yeah, I mean, realistically... That is what it is. I mean, you can't force your friends to enjoy games that they don't like, but you can certainly try to bring them into that situation. I mean, if it's something that they just, it's got something that just, it's a hard pass for them. They just really don't like that thing. Then you're probably just going to have to find other friends to play it with or not play it. Or, or you know, go to conventions where you might find a, a wider group of people who would actually be interested in playing it. You know, once people are comfortable going to conventions, of course. Yo Chang says, I thought the Umbra Via playthrough was a funny watch as you were bidding against yourself, but you still said, I don't know what my opponents will do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit cheeky, right? Um, doing videos like that with blind bidding and especially simultaneous actions, it, it's, it's a strange one for me mentally. And if I'm being honest, there were many times where I wasn't lying. I wasn't sure what my opponents were going to do. Specifically for Umbra Via, it's got a blind bidding mechanic where you make some bids behind a screen. And what I did in that game is for every one of the rounds, I'd kind of figure out what player A would do, uh, and I'd put the screen down, and then I'd figure out what player B would do, put the screen down, and then I'd sit there and think about what I would do. And by the time I was thinking about what I was going to do, I had forgotten the specifics about what the two other two players were doing. And I kind of just winged it from that point on, which is, you know, the way the game is supposed to go. So it let me kind of get into the character of not knowing what the other two people would do. I think over the years, I've actually developed some sort of mental ability to forget about some of the things that I've done in the past, uh, in the brief past when I'm trying to be different characters. It's like I've, I've been training my brain to split up into multiple strategic paths, if that makes sense. Um, and, you know, after repetition, it seems like I'm getting a little bit better. It is funny though. I, I fully admit, uh, <laughs> especially considering, you know, I often have the, like, I'm thinking this or we are thinking that, um, when of course, you know, I'm actually the puppeteer <laughs> pulling all of the strings. Uh, and hopefully, you know, it ends up being entertaining. It seems like people tend to like those things. Uh, Jesse says, uh, I should get in touch with game night. You would make a great guest player. Yeah. Uh, honestly, that, that'd be fun. I, I'm, I'm friends with 
uh, Lincoln and Nikki, uh, mostly through Gamma, um, for I think the previous four years when Gamma actually happened, uh, I'd actually drive out to Reno. I live about three hours away from Reno. Uh, I drive out there and I volunteered for the Board Game Geek stream, uh, mostly because I just wanted to get to know people. And it's fun to, it's fun work, if that makes sense. Like the volunteering of the stream, it's a really good time. Uh, and they also paid for my hotel room. So I appreciate that as well. Uh, and it's the only big convention, uh, that's within driving distance really uh, of, uh, the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, so because I've done that a bunch, I've actually hung out with, uh, uh, Lincoln, a whole bunch, uh, also Scott from board game geek and, uh, Eric Martin and, uh, Chaz and Rodney and all those just wonderful people. Um, and we have, talked about it before uh, with Lincoln about potentially doing that, but um, he lives uh, seven, eight hours away from me, uh, so it's not exactly close. <laughs> I would certainly be down for it. Maybe it's something that we can happen, uh, have happen at some point. Uh, I, I would love to do it. Uh, Shrey says, have you been able to complete any legacy slash campaign games? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, my wife and I did Pandemic Legacy Season 1 together. Uh, my wife and I, plus two friends, did Season 2 together, and Gosh, are those the only two? Uh, we started season three, and honestly, we kind of stalled out halfway through. Um, it just wasn't pulling us in for a variety of reasons. I feel like, I feel a little silly. Like, I put that game on my top ten list for last year, and then proceeded immediately after that to lose all interest in playing it. So I feel like I overrated that one, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, but I think those are the only full-on campaign. Oh, no, uh, we finished The King... Uh, Oh my gosh, what was it called? The King's Dilemma. We finished a complete campaign of The King's Dilemma over the uh, course of the pandemic. We did that entirely on Tabletop Simulator, and that one certainly took a while. All right. Um, Metal Brain says, um, is there any dungeon crawlers that you enjoy? Um, Gloomhaven is one that I've probably played the most out of any dungeon crawl type games. I've played that one 30 times. And uh, 30 plus times, actually. I can't remember the exact number of times. Uh, we did not finish that campaign, mostly because... I don't know, life happened and we just kind of wanted to play other games and people got married and had kids and, you know, that kind of stuff. It just uh, put in some delays. But I do think that Gloomhaven is my favorite dungeon crawler. Um, I was thinking about, uh, what was it, Descent a little bit the other day, like the edition that came out in 2009 and how much I loved that game when it first came out. Uh, so I have a lot of nostalgic memory of of really digging that one, but it definitely had some problems, and Gloomhaven has just blown me away. I've just really enjoyed playing that one. Um, I have a copy of Jaws of the Lion, uh, but I've not had an opportunity to play it. It would not surprise me if that would end up being my favorite um, dungeon crawl based off of the limitations that it puts in to kind of bring the scope into a smaller, more realistic, better package. Um, Elise says, is it just me, or are there fewer games coming out at the moment, maybe because of the rising shipping prices? Have you noticed the effects of the shipping crisis on the board games coming out? Um, I have not necessarily noticed a slowing down of um, the amount of releases coming out, but I've definitely been hearing about the shipping crisis that's happening, and uh, lots of games are supposed to be coming out, you know, this month, and then they don't come out until the month after that, or the month after that. Like, lots of delays. I'm definitely seeing a lot of delays. Um, as far as the uh, effects uh, of this crisis that's happening. Um, I haven't personally felt that yet. There's a couple projects that I'm supposedly going to be doing videos for, but the video, the games have to come off of the ships uh, before that can actually happen. I will admit, I've heard some podcasts about this and seen a bunch of Twitter threads, and, you know, it, it has me worried for a lot of different reasons. From an empathetic perspective, I'm really worried about my friends in the publisher sphere who are just really struggling to meet their commitments to the backers of their games and all that kind of stuff, while also trying not to actively lose money on getting these games shipped over. So um, a lot of empathy there. And I also have no idea how this might affect the professional board game media space. I haven't felt it yet, but it would not surprise me if there is a uh, wave on the horizon that's going to be interacting and making things harder from that perspective as well. Um, it, it's hard to not see this being a global issue, at least, uh, well, I mean, it's definitely a global issue as far as the globe is concerned, but as far as the overall board gaming um, hobby is concerned, I see this affecting everything. So I I'm really glad that I'm seeing all of these different publishers retweeting their own uh, messages about it and uh, going as guest spots on podcasts, just trying to inform the public as much as possible because they're doing the best that they can. Uh, on average, you know, 95, 8% of them are doing the absolute best they can, trying to make the best of a really bad situation that they could not have seen coming. I mean, obviously running a Kickstarter campaign during a pandemic is, uh, you know, there's an inherent additional amount of risk 
in doing that. But, you know, when those campaigns were all run last year, they had, there was no reason to think that this specific shipping crisis was going to happen. And I, I, I know that many of these publishers added additional padding because of the pandemic, but not necessarily, oh, the shipping is going to cost an extra $200,000 kind of padding. That's just insane. Abe asks, which game and who made you first become interested in board gaming? Uh, so, uh, sorry, my English is a little awkward. Yeah, I'm Dutch. No, no worries, Tabe. No worries. Um, that's easy. I'm one of the numerous people who fell into board gaming through Settlers of Catan. Um, I played a bunch of games when I was a kid, you know, Monopoly, Can't Stop, actually. I still own the copy of Can't Stop that I played when I was a child. Uh, but, you know, when I became a teenager, I became obsessed with video games. And I remember in college kind of hearing about Settlers of Catan, and I was vaguely interested in playing this board game, but it didn't really grab me in any way, like enough to try and go out and make it happen. And then I was at a party in 2009, 2008, the beginning of 2008. I went to a, a party where I knew one person. It was a coworker and um, I was recently single and that coworker said, hey, come to this house party. You seem like you're down. And I was. And so I went where no, I knew nobody. And within the first 10 minutes, just people were so nice at this party, just like meeting everybody. And I learned that they had a Settlers of Catan, Catan game that they just played like every single week. And uh, they invited me to join in. In fact, later that specific night, uh, everybody else left the party and I was the last person there. And I ended up playing, uh, they taught me Liar's Dice that night. Uh, so I guess you could maybe argue that Liar's Dice is the one that kind of pulled me in. Um, but we had a blast. It was me and the two people who lived there. Uh, we became fast friends. Um, we had a great time with Liar's Dice. I went home at like 3.30 in the morning. And then the next week I played Settlers of Catan. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> uh, really, I mean, one of those two guys uh, ended up meeting my sister through me. They're married and they have a couple of kids. So like that was a very important house party that I happened to go to that I didn't really want to go to because I didn't know anybody. But you never know when there's a situation where it could just change your whole life. Like a coworker saying, hey, you want to come to a random party with me tonight? And uh, yes or no had some pretty massive ramifications on my life as well as my sister's. Uh, Truck Driving Gamer says, one of my favorite games as a teenager was 221B Baker Street, a clue-style game with a Sherlock Holmes mystery to solve. What's your favorite modern mystery-solving style game? Uh, hmm. That's interesting. You know, I actually played Clue a couple of years ago for the first time since I was a child and was surprised at how much fun I had with it. I didn't like the roll and uh, move aspect to that game, but I, I did like the, uh, the sleuthing out, trying to figure out what the specific thing was. Uh, but as far as a better answer to you, um, probably Mysterium. I mean, there's it's kind of like an, a procedurally generated mystery, if that makes sense. Like, it's not like something where you read through documents and it's crafted. Uh, it's something that's built by cards. But um, there's definitely a mystery to be solved within each one of those games. And I really enjoy the collaborative effort, uh, that fully cooperative asymmetric game. I think that's probably still my favorite deduction style game overall. It's, it's a really cool game. It's been years since I played it. I certainly would not mind playing that one again. Uh, Jinrei says, news, there's going to be a sequel of sorts to the King's Dilemma called the Queen's, Di Queen's Dilemma. That's cool. I, I, that is news to me. Thank you, Jinrei. <laughs> that was a, an interesting game. I would be curious to see how the Queen's Dilemma is different from the King's Dilemma, uh, because I liked a lot of what happened in the King's Dilemma, but I didn't love everything. Um, and I don't remember all the specifics. I'd have to watch the video I made talking about my impressions to remember those specifics. But um, hearing about that, that makes me hopeful that maybe they've tweaked some things to make uh, the overall uh, gaming experience even better. Chrissy says, what Kickstarter games did you back this month, if any, uh, any that you're on the fence or thinking about taking the plunge for? Um, I haven't backed a game on Kickstarter for a little bit, um, for at least a couple of months, but I will say that there's a Kickstarter coming out later this month or I think it's called The Lost Code, and it's a reprint of a game called Think Straight, um, designed by Leo Colavini, and I am 99% sure I'm going to be backing that one. Um, I remember when Think Straight came out, I heard great things about it. Um, it's kind of a competitive deduction style game, and every piece of media that I saw for it said the game is excellent and the components are awful. Uh, it it doesn't, didn't look very good, and apparently the components were also super flimsy. So hearing that they're taking that game and they are retheming it and it's being done by a new publisher and going up on Kickstarter, I think that's just a 100%. I said 99, but 99.9% I, I, <laughs> that I'm going to be backing that one because I do like the idea. I don't think it's particularly heavy, so the idea of a medium-weight competitive deduction style game sounds cool, and the artwork that I've seen for it so far looks super cool as well. Um, I don't have 
any relationship at all with the publisher of that one. In fact, I can't remember the name of that publisher off the top of my head. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I'm just going to be putting my money where my mouth is and just buying that one when I can or, you know, backing it on Kickstarter. Elise says, have you ever been recognized as a YouTube famous person in random places where you did not expect it? Uh, no, that hasn't happened. Uh, the only time I've ever been recognized is when it would make sense, uh, specifically at board game conventions. Uh, when I've gone to Essen and Board Game Geek Con and Gen Con and all of those type of things, I very frequently get, you know, people come up to me and talk to me about the YouTube channel, but it's never happened in public. I mean, the YouTube channel has a ton of subscribers for the board game space, but in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> it's, it's not that surprising. Uh, I will say that, you know what? I was about to say that I had a different answer to that, but I have also been recognized at Victory Point Cafe. Uh, but again, that's not too surprising considering it's a board game cafe. So I guess I've never been recognized outside of a specific board gaming situation. And honestly, I'm totally fine with that. Um, being in, at board game conventions and whatnot and being very recognizable and having lots of people come up and talk to me, um, that's all great. But it's also... <sighs> I don't, I don't want to say stressful. It, it's it's a strange emotion <laughs> that I was certainly not used to walking around and, and realizing that people see you like you see people look and then turn away and then snap back and be like, oh, I recognize that person. And I'm just like me. I'm just John. I'm just at a board game convention doing my thing. And it, it's a strange experience. And I, I don't envy actual celebrities who can't go to the supermarket without that happening. Like it's it's kind of nice only having that happen in specific situations where I put myself in that situation. Uh, I think if I was being recognized on the street, that would, uh, that would definitely change things. Uh, and, I, and I'm not, I don't think I would like that <laughs> if I'm being honest. It's nice being normal when I could be normal and then be visible and uh, very recognizable when uh, I put myself into those situations. Dice Matrix asks, uh, I'm a big fan of Cry Havoc's combat system. What games have a more cleaned up, efficient mechanic noticed by you? Wow, it's been a while since I thought about Cry Havoc. Um, huh. I remember in Cry Havoc, it had, there's like three different buckets. There's like capture, kill, and like try to take control. And I don't remember how exactly that works, but I do remember it being quite streamlined. And so thinking about other game systems and whatnot, I mean, Honestly, the things that pop into my head are the things that I have experienced recently. Uh, I made a sponsored video for Soul Raiders, which is a, a theme story-driven dungeon crawler kind of game. And in that one, I really liked the combat because you um, are running around an area and there's monsters that you're fighting. And you're not rolling any dice. You just It's a deck-building game, essentially. And you play cards from your hand and you add the numbers up. And if the numbers meet the amount of health that the enemies have, then you just defeat them. Um, you just either have the cards or you don't. And I guess that leads me to a broader answer to your question. That um, I think I like it when combat is not random. You know, you're not rolling dice. Uh, I know that I said I love Gloomhaven. It's probably my favorite dungeon crawler. Um, and there is randomness from the luck of the draw on the top of that stack. Although you do have some way to mitigate that. Like you you do deck building in that uh, little uh, modifier deck, which is super cool. Although I have to admit, I, I really do like just knowing a thing is going to happen with combat and then moving on, which, you know, is not great for every game. Uh, I, I think back to other games like this and uh, Diplomacy is a game I played a bunch like 13 years ago, <laughs> a really long time ago. We played a bunch of games on online and that one has, you know, one-to-one -one combat. You just, you know, one thing attacks, one thing defends and they both get removed. And there's a bunch of other stuff going on in that game as far as the political complications, but it's a very streamlined game system. And I always really appreciated that in that game. So I guess I, I do like streamlined combat when, uh, when it comes to the games that I'm playing. Xenosis asks, uh, I miss your extended playthroughs. I think they really help get a feeling for how a game play feels and plays. Would you consider doing them uh, for more advanced titles? Well, it's interesting that you say that because the uh, extended playthrough was essentially me playing the rest of the game. Uh, before I did extended playthroughs, I just had the tutorial video do uh, the entire game. It was just a full playthrough always, um, every single game, every single video was a full playthrough. And I did that for years. And then I decided to try and split them up because my thinking was my, th at the time that people would be intimidated saying like a two hour video, I'm like, I don't want to watch a two hour video, but I teach most of the game in the first 20 to 30 minutes. So the idea was, okay, I have a tutorial video where I teach most of the rules. 
and it looks like a 20 to 30 minute video. So people are less intimidated by that and more likely to click on it. And then if they're into it and they're digging it, then they'll move on and watch the extended playthrough. Uh, and I did that for well over a year. Um, but the, the, the issue is that when I make a full playthrough for each one of these games, it just takes too much time. And it's also not fun for me. Um, doing... <sighs> the, 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 it's hard to describe the amount of time that these things often take. Like, for instance, the Frosthaven full playthrough um, was like 15 or 16 hours of raw video. So that's 15 or 16 hours of me with the camera above my head, thinking through and playing through all these things. Um, you know, imagine a long game. You know, when people think of a long game, they probably think of like a three to four hour gaming experience. Well, now think about doing it for two full work days. Like two full work days, you have the camera rolling, filming it, and then you have to edit all that, which is gonna take another you know, 10 to 12 hours or something like that. It just took an incredible amount of time. And if I really enjoyed doing all of that, then it would have made sense, but it was stressful. And honestly, there were so many days where I'd wake up and I'd be like, all right, you know, time to continue playing that game I was filming for like, you know, eight hours yesterday. Like, I just want this to be done. I wanna move on to the next thing. So last year, I decided to stop doing extended playthroughs entirely. And I just stopped doing full playthroughs entirely. Uh, and I did that for months. But then over time, I've started doing full playthroughs again when I feel like it. And that has been a pretty good thing, uh, honestly, from like a, um, a mental perspective. Because now I can make that decision. Like, do I feel like making a full playthrough for this game? Yes or no. Do I have time to make a full playthrough for this game? Yes or no. Because this is my full-time job and I only have so many hours in the day. So, you know, if the schedule is really crammed, then I might not be able to. I remember I, I, I did want to make a full playthrough for the Anno 1800 video, but I had so many other projects to do. I just didn't have the extra full day, like full work day it would have taken to make a full playthrough on that. I needed that full day to work on other things so that I wouldn't fall behind from all of the commitments that I made to Patreon supporters as well as publishers. Uh, now, I have noticed <laughs> that I've been having a hard time getting ahead. I've been just barely not falling behind. And I also have noticed that I've been making a ton of full playthroughs. And I know this is a really long answer to your question, but you say that you missed the extended playthroughs. And honestly, that kind of surprises me because I've essentially been making full playthroughs for 80% of the videos that I've been putting out for the last two months. And I've actually kind of realized I need to, I unfortunately, need to pull back a little bit and remind myself that I don't need to make full playthroughs for all of these games. I can make them for when it makes sense and not for when it doesn't um, because these videos have been taking more and more time and it's been stressing me out and putting me more and more behind. Um, so the short answer after that really long answer is that I don't see myself breaking the videos up. And again, uh, I think there were some issues with the YouTube uh, algorithm. Didn't like that as much as well. Um, but I am trying to do full playthroughs when it makes sense. Um, if it's a game that has like a big crescendo at the end. And if I don't think I can do the whole thing, then I try to have a fast forward to get to that end point. I, I do understand that a lot of people like to um, see it all the way to the end. But another big part of it is that I saw the math. I, I, well, I saw the numbers anyway, for the extended playthroughs. And they got so many less views. <laughs> and it was really unfortunate. Like the extended playthrough took like 75% of the project and it would get like 20% of the views of that full tutorial. And, you know, when this is my full-time job and I only have so many hours in the day, I had to Take a long, hard look at that and make some changes. Long Live Live uh, asks, hopefully you haven't answered this already, but with your newish love of Cube Rails games, have you had a chance to play any 18xx games? Uh, yeah, I have played three 18xx games at this point. Uh, the first one was 1867, um, and the second one was 18 Chesapeake, and the third one was 18 Euro, I think it's called? Yeah, I think it's called 18 euro. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Uh, it's It has a drafting variant and I played with the drafting variant. Um, and I, for the most part, enjoyed all three of those games. But I also, especially after that last game, not, not because of that last game, but just after playing three different types of 18xx games, which all felt quite different, I realized that I, I prefer a cube rails game because I like the stock trading and I like the shared incentives and I like the 60 minute play time as opposed to the five, hour playtime, five plus hour playtime. Um, so yeah, I'm not against playing more 18xx games. I imagine I, I very likely will in the future, but I'm not hunting them down and trying to play them like I am for Cube Rails games because uh, they just have a much more compact uh, experience for getting all of the, that fun stuff that I enjoy. And a lot of people love 18xx games, which I, I do understand in theory, but for me, I feel like I get the same amount of fun out of a much smaller amount of time, and I'd rather play five Cube Rails games in five hours versus playing one 18xx game in five hours. 
Uh, Reishi asks, how is your schedule overall? Are you catching up slowly? Yes, I, I, I am. Uh, at this point, I feel like I am more caught up than I've been in many months. Um, I actually have essentially all the videos done I need for this week, which is great. Um, the video coming out tomorrow is Rat Queens, and it's done. Uh, the video coming out on Thursday is the Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition uh, tutorial, and that one is done. It's 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 up there. In fact, I already uh, sent a link to it to all the Patreon supporters of the channel uh, so that they could watch it without the advertising. So they could watch it right now. Um, and it felt great to put that out three days early because normally I put those out like one day early. Uh, so that's a really good feeling because it means I can now start working on the videos for next week. And if I can continue to slowly get ahead, then maybe I can get back to that comfortable spot where I'm working on videos like two to three weeks out, which is really what I want to do because, you know, I, I, it's just me over here. I, I'm in a pretty fragile situation as far as the schedule is concerned. If I, if I get a curveball, if I get sick, well, I don't get sick time. <laughs> if I get sick, then I'm just not making videos. And then that's going to have a rippling catastrophic impact on my overall schedule. So having a couple weeks of uh, uh, lead time, or I guess runway, is a better way to think about it, means I'm much more uh, able to uh, weather various uh, curveballs that I might have. And I've been fortunate that I haven't had any curveballs that have caused a catastrophic situation to happen in my schedule uh, over the last few months. Because, wow, if, you know, even just losing a couple days here or there could have had a, a really big impact. Uh, uh, Mom Gamer asks, uh, do you still have time to shop for new games or are you too busy with your work schedule? Um, yeah, I, I definitely have time to shop for new games. I mean, I, you know, I just talked a whole bunch about, you know, the stress of trying not to fall behind and trying to get ahead and all that. But I do also try to work a regular day. You know, I try not, I try to keep my work life balance in check. Uh, so, you know, in general, I try to work from about nine in the morning until about five to 6 PM in the evening. And I usually have a 30 to 60 minute lunch break, um, that I have with my wife. Cause she also works from home right now. Um, so after that, I try to, you know, not to work. Uh, if things get stressful and the schedule falls behind, then I work longer, but that's a long way of saying that in my downtime, I do still enjoy shopping for games and looking out for games. In fact, I, uh, uh, I just put in an order for some more uh, Hollenspiel games. Um, they just put out uh, a re-release of a couple of really tiny games that I've heard great things about, uh, the Toledo War and Reign of Witches, and I wanted to acquire a copy of those. So I picked those up, and I also grabbed a copy of Meltwater along the way. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely have time to shop for these games still. Um, I, I try not to buy too many games, you know, especially considering I can receive so many of them uh, as press copies, but... Um, I'm still obsessed with board games. I love board games, and I, and I still absolutely love shopping for them and, and getting new ones in. Elise asks, what games have surprised you the most recently um, being better than you expected? Hmm. That's tough. You know what? I'm going to take a quick look at my games I've played list, see if anything jumps out to me. Oh, okay. Well, I would probably say Imperium Classics, uh, or Imperium in general. I played that one once, and I still haven't talked about it in a good games vlog, but I plan to. Um, normally, I talk about these things after one play, but I have Imperium Classics and Imperium Legends, and I want to play one game with Imperium Legends before I discuss my impressions of it. But I can tell you right now that I was surprised at how much I liked it. Not because I thought it would be bad or that I would dislike it, but it seemed like there was... It was maybe more complicated than I was really hoping for in a deck builder. And when I played it that first time, I was blown away at how much fun I was having. I just had such a great time. So I'm looking forward to playing that one again. I think that was probably the biggest surprise. I was expecting to think it was fine. Uh, I was expecting to enjoy it overall. I wasn't expecting to have like a grin plastered on my face the entire time, uh, anxiously waiting for my next turn. It was it was a lot of fun that, that first time. And maybe that was a fluke. I don't know. Uh, again, I do want to play this one again, specifically to try some of those legendary nations out. Uh, um, I want to see what those are like. Bomb Gamer asks, uh, do I have any other hobbies beyond board games? Um, for the most part, no. <laughs> board games are my entire life, essentially, because they're my business and they're also like the thing I do for fun. Uh, but I will say that recently I have been uh, actually really enjoying a very specific video game. Uh, I used to be a big video gamer, uh, like back in college, back in like, you know, 2003, 2004. I was obsessed with World of Warcraft and Diablo and other Blizzard games, as well as many other non-Blizzard games. I, I tried to get a job with, at Blizzard. I wanted to be in the, the video game industry back when I was a lot younger. Um, and then ultimately that changed. And when I found board games, I lost all interest in video games. And recently I've been kind of coming back. Uh, specifically, I've been playing a game called Subnautica and um, its sequel a lot for the past month and a half. Like a lot, a lot. Like 
<laughs> closing on a hundred hours or so, if you consider the playing and also I'd watch some let's plays and stuff. So that almost feels like a side hobby for me at this moment. Um, most evenings at this point, I play an hour or two of Subnautica, which is this survival game where you're underwater, like a, as a scuba diver, trying to make bases and survive things and explore. It's, it's really, it emphasizes the exploration, does not emphasize combat. It has an actual story. It's not a roguelike. And I, Oh man, I'm so over roguelikes and video games. So um, to a certain extent, I'd say that is that is a kind of a slightly rekindled hobby with that one specific game. And I'm not sure if it'll apply to other video games um, after I'm done with this one. Um, and I've really been trying to get back into reading. Um, I, I started reading a book called uh, A Memory Called Empire after getting a whole bunch of recommendations for it. And I got about a third of the way through it after about a month. And I just wasn't digging it. And, and I needed, I, I have this thing with books where I just feel like I have to finish the book I'm reading before I can start the next one. I don't understand people who can read multiple books at the same time. And I, I came to the conclusion, like, if I'm not digging it, if, if it feels like work to read a book, then I should just stop reading it. Like, I don't owe that book anything. So I think I've decided to stop reading that one. And then I got a, another recommendation from a friend for Project Hail Mary. And I started reading that a couple days ago. And I, I, I've been reading a lot. Like, that, that book is really fun. So in this exact moment, I feel like I have these other hobbies of reading and video games. But this is a very new rekindling on both of those. But I'm hoping to try and keep pushing those forward because... You know, life is about variety, and for me, I'm like 90% board games, <laughs> and and I, I do love board games, and that's great. But but sometimes you need to you know shake things up a little bit. Oh, here we go, here we go. Uh, Chrissy says, "I love your full playthroughs. Did you learn how to teach games formally, like at a convention, or did you just evolve it naturally?" Um, it evolved naturally. I, I actually have no experience realistically with teaching games at a convention, like at a booth or something like that. Um, I just when I was falling into the board gaming hobby, I was ravenous. I would play any game. I, I didn't care. There was months where I would go to multiple board game nights uh, in, a, in a week and learn, you know, two to five new games in that night and just like new games, new games, new games all the time. And within about a year, I, I pivoted around and now I was the person buying these new games and then I was the person pushing to teach them because after about a year, I, you know, kind of learned all the games that all my friends were trying to push. And then I switched gears into being the game owner, like the person who was extreme cult of the new, who would buy everything, all the new releases, and then, you know, arrive at every new game night with a new game to play, almost never playing the same game twice. And uh, yeah, just got a lot of experience teaching thousands of games <laughs> over the course of the years. I like to think I'm pretty good at it. I don't think I'm amazing. Like, like I don't think about it a lot, if that makes sense. Like, I, I definitely know some board game teachers have, like, a theory behind how they teach board games. And when I've thought about it, I, I have a hard time articulating it. I just teach the game, and people generally understand it. <laughs> so I guess it's just a, a feel thing for me. Uh, Chrissy asks, do you have a favorite game designer right now? If so, who? What is your favorite game from them? Um, yeah, I think I do. Uh, especially, especially like over the last few months, I would say my current favorite game designer is Amabel Holland. Um, she has made a bunch of Cube Rails games as well as a bunch of other games. But in particular, my favorite for, uh, Cube Rails games were designed by her. Um, Trans Siberian Railroad is currently my favorite by a squeaker. Uh, and then my second favorite is Iberian Gage, um, which Amabel designed both of those. Um, and then Dual Gage is another Cube Rails game that she made that I, I really like. Uh, in fact, the, uh, I guess the games I ordered from Hollandspiel, uh, which is the publishing company that she co-runs and publishes essentially all of her designs. Um, a couple of the games that I picked up uh, she designed, but a couple of them aren't. She didn't design Meltwater. But either way, um, it seems like Amabel has a really fascinating way of of telling strange stories with mechanics that I really dig. And um, it seems like she's been uh, prevalent in the cube rails scene for quite some time. And since that's something I've been really falling into, I don't think it's too surprising that uh, she's been my, my favorite designer uh, of late. Anyway, uh, I'm certainly... Um, actively anticipating every new release that she comes out with, if that makes sense, because it seems like every game that she makes is just fascinating <laughs> to a certain degree or another. Uh, Chrissy says, when you get to play for your own pleasure, i.e. not for work, 
and the group is not a factor, which games are you pulling off the shelf first? Uh, well, I'm a broken record. I mean, right now, it's Cube Rails games, <laughs> specifically because I've got some that I haven't even tried yet and that I would really like to try. Um, I've been a little reticent to bring them to my in-person board game meetups for some reason. Um, I should just bring them and, and see if I can get other people to try them. I think I'm just worried that my friends that I've been playing games with for years won't like them as much as I will, and then, you know, I won't have the opportunity to play them. But if I don't try to play it with them, then I'm still not playing those games, so... It's something I just need to get over, I think. Jinrei says, ooh, Subnautica is great. I don't have the sequel yet, but most likely the next video game I'm getting into is the Ace Attorney Chronicles. Cool. Uh, yeah, the sequel is very good. I actually watched a Let's Play of Subnautica the entire first game because I thought I'd be too scared. I'm a huge scaredy cat in movies and media and certainly video games. And I just kept hearing that it was scary. So I watched somebody play it for like 40 hours and fell in love with it. So then I played the full sequel and I beat it just a few days ago. And um, then I bought the first game and now I'm playing through the first game, even though I watched somebody play through it already. So uh, I still definitely get scared, but I'm trying to learn how to get over the fear of things, if that makes sense. And maybe get a little less uh, sensitized to <laughs> sensitize, uh, g get a little less uh, 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 scared when things are scary. Like enjoy the fear more than just hate it. If that makes sense. Like for a long time, I felt like um, you know a lot of people don't like spicy food. They say, "Why would I eat spicy food? It hurts." Well, for me, for a long time, I've said, "Why would I watch something scary? It's scary." Like why would you want to do that? Whereas me, I love spicy food. And I say, well, I eat spicy food because it's amazing. Yeah, it hurts a bit, but like, I also get all those endorphins. And I know that a lot of people get that off of scary stuff too. And I'm trying to work myself into it a little bit more. And I mean, the fact that the game is wonderful is, is definitely a nice way to lead me, uh, lead me into that. Uh, Chrissy says, you're looking up Subnautica. You hope it's not immersive, as immersive as World of Warcraft or Diablo, or you won't see you next month. Well, I mean, World of Warcraft was, you know, built to be addictive in the long run, like years, uh, and Diablo to a slightly lesser extent. I mean, speaking from my perspective, I was very obsessed with World of Warcraft. I played it um, for about 80 hours a week for about three years when it first came out. Um, so, yes, I definitely feel your pain there. I was a very active raider back then. But anyway, Subnautica is a fully single-player experience, and the, the first one is apparently a game that you can finish in about... 40 to 50 hours, um, depending on how quickly you want to get through it. And I actively don't want to get through these quickly because it's all about exploring and really enjoying the environment. And actually, Efka, uh, from No Pun Included, is the reason I even tried these. I was having a pretty low time, like I was just not in a good headspace. And he recommended it to just, you know, transport me into a different world. And wow, what a great recommendation. Thank you, Efka. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I think that is going to bring this one to a close. Uh, thank you so much to everybody for joining in um, and to everybody who uh, watches and listens to this later on. Uh, yeah, uh, I will be, I'll be doing another one of these a month from now. Uh, hopefully I'll have less technical issues and glitches. I'll, I'll try to do some work on the back end and see if I can make things uh, a little bit smoother for the next one. But either way, thank you again, everybody, uh, for joining in. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.